All Americans must have the privileges of citizenship, regardless of race. And they are going to have those privileges of citizenship, regardless of race. But I would like to caution you and remind you that to exercise these privileges takes much more than just legal right. It requires a trained mind and a healthy body. It requires a decent home and the chance to find a job and the opportunity to escape from the clutches of poverty. During the year 67, 68, there were many protests on campus, very small protests on campus to try to get a number of things that, to be changed in terms of racial issues. And it wasn't going anywhere. The people of color on campus felt that Marquette wasn't doing enough to get people with scholarships in and, and diversify the campus. But nothing was happening. I would say the administration was pretty much opposed, uh, not just opposed because they didn't have to do anything, but I really think that they didn't believe that this was an appropriate thing for them to do. I was a student at Marquette back in the 50s, so for me in a certain sense it was a return to Milwaukee. And what motivated me to go to Milwaukee was my wife now had moved to Milwaukee. So I needed employment. There was no openings in, in European history, and certainly not in French, but they wanted to offer an African-American history course, and would I be interested in doing that? So I agreed to teach this course. I come here tonight and plead with you. Believe in yourself and believe that you're somebody. As I said to the group last night, Nobody else can do this for us. This effort here, in a sense, began the night after Dr. King was assassinated. That was in April of 1968. Good evening. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, 39 years old and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and the leader of the nonviolent civil rights movement in the United States, was assassinated in Memphis tonight. My wife became home around five o'clock that evening in tears. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, they've killed the nonviolent leader. And I said, what do you mean? She said, Dr. King was assassinated this afternoon. And so we were, I was in shock when I heard that. So the, the turning point was the death of Martin Luther King. And after Dr. King was killed, we called another demonstration, and instead of 50 people showing up, a thousand people showed up. These students were meeting and praying at the St. Jones Chapel every day. They had bread and water. We were fasting and praying. This is Profile Marquette's Protest. <laughs> On Tuesday evening, May 7th, Father James Groppy, Milwaukee's famous white civil rights priest, spoke to students at Marquette University. Less than 24 hours after Father Groppy's address, Marquette students demonstrated in front of the student union and prevented guests from departing a pair Marquette Day dinner. The climate in Milwaukee in 68 was tense. Uh, not just because Dr. King had been killed, but more because of the open housing marches being led by Father Groppy a very charismatic priest, and, and they marched across, I guess it was a 16th Street Bridge into the south side of Milwaukee. Overcome the Lord one day. We have 
tried every means possible to bring fair housing legislation to the city of Milwaukee. And we're going to continue to march. Father. It's up to the government of this city and of this state to see to it that we can exercise our constitutional right of freedom of speech. And we're going to exercise that, regardless of what the danger. We'll die for that right. So many of us that were involved in those marches started this group on campus called SURE. They formed a coalition and demanded that Marquette University become more responsive to the local low-income and minority community and to recruit students from a, the, a culturally distinct and disadvantaged background. The way the university ultimately embraced the program and embraced the idea and that didn't happen in, in many places. The university responded. In January of 59, they established this effort. They said, hey, uh, we just created this, this new position uh, for this new program, special program for culturally distinct students. We'd like for you to take a look at it. And I said, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> I said, this is insane. You're asking someone to go out and recruit African Americans who are militant and alienated and angry, and this is a Catholic university, and, and, and this culture is, is foreign to them. And I mean, this, this is it's a fool's errand, and, I, and I'm not a fool. And, and I took it because I thought it was a challenge. I was feeling somewhat guilty in, with respect to uh, my people, African Americans. I didn't felt I had done enough during the Civil Rights era. And I told Dr. Simmons that this was a radical experiment that was not going anywhere. So I took the job and told him I'd give them five semesters. And of course, five semesters, it turned out to be a lifetime. Well, once I, I was in it, uh, my ego took hold and I didn't want to fail. I wanted to work. And so I took it upon myself to try to create an organization that's the way you fight back. People organize and they speak truth to power. The COE, from the beginning, there, there has been a conscious decision before we were even created. Let's not make eligibility, let's not make our focus be race, let's make it be economics. I believe I had these, these students and they had to win. They had to be successful. They had to succeed. So the first thing I did was I told them that they were special, that they were an elite. And I reminded them constantly that there's only 40 of us and there are hundreds in Milwaukee who could benefit from these services who would love to be here. I reminded them of their ethnic and racial identities and their families and how they were measured against that and, and how you know they had to succeed. They were doing it for their mama, they were doing it for their block, they were doing it for their school. It wasn't just you doing it for yourself. I told them that if they weren't successful the program would die and, and I also told them that getting a bachelor's degree was not sufficient, that they had to become leaders. They had to think in terms of at least master's degrees, if not Ph.D. degrees, law degrees, medical degrees, etc. What EOP tried to do was to create a counter-narrative to the kinds of messages our students were receiving about their lack of capacity. And that counter-narrative was about treating our students as intellectuals and then allowing them to demonstrate their intellectuality, and it worked. I grew up in the projects in Milwaukee, first generation, low income, mother died when I was 10, into a lot of trouble. I was a ticket time bomb. I was a person that I didn't value myself. I had a low self-esteem. I had an inferiority complex. I tried to kill myself. I had no confidence in my own abilities. And there was a poster up for Upper Bound that said, do you want to go to college? Do you want to be somebody? And I just looked at the poster and I wanted to be somebody, even though I didn't think back then I actually could go to college and finish college and get a degree. Upper Brown really just helped me realize 
and to see the, the potential and the greatness that I had inside of me. The pressure to perform and to do well was tremendous uh, in those first days because I had a lot of sociological problems. I was a single parent with a baby and so Marquette really part of the program was not just to provide tutoring, not just to enroll me in classes, but to really sort of uh, intervene in the many social problems that I had. And Mitch's philosophy at that time was he wanted to build a leadership class and your job is going to be to go back into communities and do the jobs that need to be done so that you do well but that you can also do good. So I did everything I could to build, to be comprehensive, to deal with the whole individual, socially, culturally, and academically, with a lot of focus on the academics. And then there was intensive advising that's going on. You know, I used to advise kids from 8 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock at night. And, it, and to me, it just made sense. You got to deal with the whole person. I mean, I didn't have to read it. or It just made sense. If you just look at a program as a service delivery mechanism. If you just look at it, oh, we provide tutoring, we provide math support, and we provide counseling, you've missed the boat. And that's where Mitch was so good. It was huge for me to see uh, males uh, be leaders and be responsible and be accountable. It was, it was huge. Really, when I think back about it, I had had almost no examples. And all of the men at EOP, to me, were leaders. I looked up to Arno Mitchum, he was almost a celebrity in some ways. It doesn't matter what your color is, it's about first generation, low income. And it really is a privilege to say that I'm an EOP graduate, I'm proud of it. The support that the staff provided, the demands and the expectations that they had of us, um, definitely propelled us and put the foundation in place for leadership opportunities. He wanted to make certain that if we had talent or any skill set, that they were going to draw it out of us. There were times when he would bang on my door of my apartment and say, get up, get your butt up, and get to class. For that, I will be forever grateful that he never gave up on my ability to go, because I had certainly given up on myself so many times. We also knew that if we were to move at a national level, that we had to have foundations, and the foundations were the one, strong programs, two, strong state organizations, three, strong regional organizations, ultimately we can have a national organization. I remember when Mitch uh, came to my office and he said, Sandy, I just, uh, you know, I'm leaving. I'm going to, you know, go to D.C., going to Washington, become the executive director of the council. And I have recommended to the administration that you take my place. By that time, I had, I mean, I saw the, the limits of what I could do here at Marquette, frankly. I was excited about the possibilities. That sort of began my journey, and that's when I went out and uh, convinced others in other parts of the United States that they should organize. We had seen great sacrifices made for opportunity, and we knew it once we were standing in the door, it was our responsibility to keep that door wide open. I thought that if we could strengthen these programs, grow these programs, that we get more of our colleges and universities to get more engaged with pushing social mobility. The real goal of that office is to protect college access and success programs nationally and to give educators who work in those programs a voice in, in how they should be run. So on a federal level, when the office was opened, the, the only college access and success programs were the federal TRIO programs. Marquette became the model for the undergraduate TRIO program called Student Support Services and when they wrote the Education Amendments in 1980. So it was a heady time. I didn't feel I was running away from Marquette. I was just taking Marquette to the world, if you will. My heart is here. Things are in good hands. And let me leave you with these final thoughts. Continue to believe in yourself. 
when you win here, when you get your A's and your B's here, it suggests strongly that you're going to win out there. If you win at Marquette, you're going to win at life. People are interested in the numbers, the metrics matter, but what they remember, what moves people are stories. I'm Zhong He and I'm coming from Thailand. I live in a refugee camp, Watanga Bo. And in 2004, the United Nations came and they took us to the United States. And I'm really proud to be here and learning. We can't, I can't really learn in the refugee camp and the teacher not really teaching you anything at all. I've been there for four years now <laughs> because I was in the Aoba program. And every summer I will go there for a summer program. They helped me a lot and it provided me more leadership skill and passion and inspired my friends and all that to work hard and yet I really appreciate the help from the Alabama and just everything they gave to me. First and foremost, academic preparation. You know, the, the ability of a student to go into higher education prepared. So they, they need strong academic preparation in high school, things that, that the Upper Bound program does so well. All of our services and all of the opportunities we provide to the kids take place here on campus. So our program offers a four-year college tour um, for these students and they start off in eighth grade intimidated. This is a, a big environment, this is Marquette University, they've probably grown up within a mile or two of here and it's been a place they've driven through but never thought they could attend or be a part of. But all of our students have IDs, they become Marquette University students, they go to the library, they go to the gym, they spend summers here. notion that students from first-generation low-income backgrounds may not have the same desire and drive, and that's not true. For us, we try to expose students to the rigor of the academy, and we kind of give them the guides, post, if you will, to succeed, and then they run with it. But to have somebody that they know, like, they can go to and talk to, they can go talk to Kiara or Steve or Nadia, and really just talk about their issues. If you can make them feel comfortable, if you can make them feel wanted and included, that the other stuff flows from that. You know, the studying, the, the working a little bit harder, the taking some critical advice. That's more palatable once they know this is somebody they can trust. This is not somebody who's going to do them wrong. I was in Upper Bound. I started my junior year and I, I graduated and then I got into EOP. I feel like Upper Bound, uh, you know, it was definitely an advantage that I had and I feel like it, it helped me get to the EOP program. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Like when it comes to national competition, talking about making a national team, this is what you want. You know, go around the world, travel, represent the United States and you know, having school in the morning, dealing with homework, being able to train two, three times a day, Arquette University. So it's a top tier school, it's, it's a, you know, it's one of the best schools, so it's not easy. It's probably the, the hardest thing I've ever dealt with. First generation, the very first one in my family, so, you know, I'd like to finish it off and be legit that first person in my family. Mommy's home. <laughs> Mom's home, my grandma, my sister should be there. My dad is uh, working second shift, so he's out there, you know, without him. This family wouldn't be how it is, you know. It's basically the, the one that holds it down together, you know. I have tons of medals. And these are two of my national championships right here. We have similar challenges that, that you deal with inside the ring, but also outside the ring, you know, and those kind of set you up, you know, whether it's here in school or in the block, in the neighborhood or whatever. EOPs also helped me, you know, Lori and all the counselors, Upper Bound, I still, you know, still talk to my counselor, Nadia, and all that, you know, and they you know, always talking, and, you know, they always give me advice. I guess you just want to work hard, you know, for your family and make their dreams come true.
Once they're enrolled in higher education, though, we really need for them to have the support that they need to help them get through that first year hurdle. You know, freshmen have a difficult time regardless of where they come from, but, but students who have not had the, the support system, you know, they're subject to the last straw. They're the ones who can be um, pushed to, to leave higher education just because someone doesn't give them the academic support or the one-on-one -on -one attention that they need. And so Student Support Services helps fill that void. I think SSS was great. You come, you know, transitioning from Upper Brown or transitioning from high school to Marquette. I think the, it, it created an environment, it, a sense of engagement, a sense of belonging, a sense of just we, we care about your success. And, you know, it really helped to connect us to the university. It really helped you with the, you know, cultural transition to college. I came from a family where my parents didn't even graduate from high school. And so to have people to kind of guide you and give you insight into what college life was going to be like, you know, what courses you should take, what professors you should try to interact with, what organizations to be involved in, all that stuff kind of gives you a wholesome college experience. Right off the bat, you are treated like family. The staff know who you are. They take an interest in your development. And so from day one, I felt like I was in an environment where everyone wanted me to succeed, so why would I pick to go anywhere else? I love Marquette. I mean, like, I don't think I can ever stop saying that. Since I was an undergrad, I really realized that I wanted to be a professor. And I thought, you know, that's sort of going to be my way to give back. I became an EOP student, and I saw things that you don't see I mean, you see it on campus, but like here, it's even better. People here care. I mean, so it, that's been such a blessing to have. I see myself in my students every day. So I, I try to challenge them because I know what's coming up. I know the challenges that they're going to face being the minority student, being the first generation college student. I'm a criminology major and a psychology minor with a juvenile focus. I want to be a juvenile role officer when I graduate. Because working at the Boys and Girls Club, I see, you know, the struggles that people go through and I feel like you can't give up on a child just because they make a mistake. They don't have the opportunity to rehabilitate like they should and they'll become a menace to society as opposed to an asset. Sometimes when I have three or four projects that are due in one week, sometimes it gets really hard. You know, when I have to work, go to work and balance school, I can do that. They teach me ways to do that because there are people that came before me. Because when I came to college, I was not organized whatsoever. I didn't know how to study. I never asked for help. I never had a tutor. But they gave me a tutor that gave me ways to structure things, to be organized that works in my schedule. My sorority is 85 by the sorority incorporated. We were founded January 16, 1920 at Howard University in Washington, D.C. on a Friday. Well, on our five minute break, you know, I do have a paper due tonight, so I have to get that done whenever possible. Probably gonna pull an all nighter tonight between practices for the yard show tomorrow. I have to finish this paper and I have to read for tomorrow, so probably not going to sleep. Oh, this is my mom and this is my dad. Like, if it wasn't for ELP, I probably would be mush on the ground right now. It's more than just a financial thing for me because the counselors there really help me. Like, if I need a shoulder to cry on, if I need to let something out, because I'm, I'm a first generation student. So my parents don't know what I'm going through at school. I can't say, well, this and that, because they don't understand. But I can go to Miss Jackie or Miss Laya or Miss Ethel before she retired, and they can understand me, and they will understand my tears and understand where I'm coming from and know how to give me advice to better myself and my situation. From my perspective, McNair provides an invaluable experience to the student to, to get an idea of the research process, how that works in the university, as well as they come away with deliverables in hand that they can put on their CV. It's a really nice launch pad for a academic career. Like being able to provide you with resources that you didn't think were available, well, you pretty much fulfill your dream like getting a PhD or getting a master's. Because their main goal at the end of everything when you graduate from college is they want you to be like a 
professor at a university so you can help diversify the faculty. The reason I kind of found this research first was, first of all, both of my parents are immigrants. My dad was the one that had like more of the harder time. He had the whole border crossing, undocumented status, and he told me all this story and like, just like how scared he really was. Um, Cause they were put like under a bus and they were just left there for like a day. Yes, these people are breaking a crime, making are they considered criminals for crossing the border. But they're all they really want is to help their families out. Because all people really see is the criminal side, they it's kinda like they get they they lose this like human element and that's that's like the pretty much the purpose of this research is to bring the human side into it. So his perspective and his cultural lens is really important. You know, it's the whole global phenomenon of people needing to move for work, really to feed their families. So bringing together his experience and his perspective with our research expertise achieves m many of the goals of the university, that is, you know, producing high quality students, diversifying the graduation, as well as improving the community as a result of Marquette being here. We try to help students to get the most out of Marquette, and so shape a college experience that's going to make them attractive to graduate schools, law schools, professional schools, and the, and the profession that they choose. Just celebration. I, I mean, I'm, I'm the first person in my, in my family to graduate. First time my mom's been to something like this or anything like that. So I start med school in the fall, helping people and sharing my knowledge because I just love learning things and then telling people about it. Maybe even throw some teaching in there as well. It's the people around me that make me realize how fortunate I am. You know, and it's, it's rare to have a person, a black person. Um, with a doctorate degree at my age. I mean, I think it's incredible now that I start to sit back and look at it. I, I didn't, I don't really think about it, but you know, now that I'm graduating, everybody like, you know, everybody's like, you know, I'm so proud of you. And you know, they kind of point the things out to me and just listening to other people say, it makes me realize how far I've come since I came to Marquette. It's really rewarding sometimes just to go back up there and you look at all the hall and you see your name, just for all students, past and present and future students, to see that you accomplished one of your goals. So that I really want to become diplomat and work for the United Nations because I want to give it back to uh, the uh, United States and to the world, which helped give me the opportunity to come over here and to learn. I, I don't know how I made it. There were some extremely difficult times that I, um, I, I faced. And I really don't want to have to imagine what college would have been like um, because while it was very challenging at Marquette, the reality is ELP made it much easier for me to adjust to. You know, I am one of the biggest champions of TRIO programs because I am a testament to the difference that it makes in my life. I would not be a member of Congress and a college graduate, I am sure of that, without the intervention of these programs. There's a lot of education groups in Washington, but mostly they represent institutional interests. Appropriately, they represent private colleges or Catholic colleges or junior co community colleges or for-profit institutions. But low-income students don't have much of a voice outside of the student organization. So they have found the solutions to serving the needs of our most at-risk students. And that needs to be explained, communicated, and really it should become infectious. The downfall of TRIO, if you will, is that it doesn't serve enough students, that the inadequacy of the funding, combined with the fact that we have a growing population of students who are not well prepared for college, who don't have that academic, financial, and social support, uh, that's a big challenge for TRIO that uh, you know, clearly has to be overcome 
if we're going to achieve the outcomes that we have as a country for our higher education system. And I really look at me and realize how mentors and how a program like Upper Bound and this program like Student Support Service Program made a difference in my life. And I wanted to give back. I think just like you receive, you should give. So, you know, I, I felt compelled to help to make a difference in other people's lives, to be, to be a mentor, to be a difference, to see potential where other people may not see potential. You want some people to come out and say, I'm not looking for a job. I'm going to actually go out and create a job. I'm going to actually create wealth for myself and for my community. You want to be able to engage in the transformation of your world. When I joined DOP at Marquette, it, it just opened up a whole other world for me. It was the whole notion that there's a cause bigger than just me. I got to learn how people organize around an issue, and I really got very enamored in that. I absolutely point that back to the experiences at DOP. So, so what else have we lost because we don't develop all of our talent? Aren't human beings our natural resource? There's been a real shift. Uh, education now is viewed more as a privilege rather than a right. And one of the things we're seeing in higher education now is fewer and fewer first-generation low-income students are able or are being attracted to or are attending institutions like Marquette. That in an ideal world, if K through 12 education did what it was supposed to do for poor children, if higher education provided the financial support and the academic support that people of limited economic means need, EOP programs would be redundant. The programs as a whole across the country are vitally necessary because we refuse to educate poor children well in the schools that we have. I think if you look at our country, we've been avoiding a lot of the hard questions and things are getting worse and worse and worse for low-income Americans. Our country is less equal now than it was in 1965. I'm just worried that, that it's no longer true that each successive generation is going to be better off than the previous generation. And that programs like EOP must continue, must thrive, because if not, then we're going to lose some of the levers that we have to try to make it better for each generation. You know, these programs are critically important to the infrastructure of America's economic well-being. And talent can be found on any number of rocks, not just the rocks that fall on the right side of the railroad track. The cost of the university goes up. The, the public support for low-income people are going down. So can we keep going in this way? Can we keep pursuing these type of trajectories? There's going to be a crisis of our democracy. Given the fact that it started in the 60s during a very turbulent time, I think Dr. Mitchum uh, mentioned to me once that it was more thought of as an experiment, if you will. We're far beyond an experiment now. We, we know that this works. We believe that our message is really, that most people in the country believe in it. The future of our children is something that people want to invest in if you can prove that you're effective and we can prove that we're effective. And now that we have created this ladder and this access for low-income first-generation students, 
It is time for us to make sure that we maintain it, that we fight the fights we've got to fight in Congress and with the White House to keep the program going. So where do I see us going in the future? We'd like to serve more students. We'd like for our graduation rate to be, uh, to be higher. We'd like to see our students to continue to be leaders, uh, not only here in Milwaukee, but around the country as they have been, kind of connect more with our alumni. They come back and they help support the program. Well, we'd like to build on that. And then we'd like to continue to be a model for the nation in terms of access programs and how to work with and be effective in terms of helping first generation underrepresented low income students. That what makes a difference for those EOP students back in the 70s, and I'm sure today, is human interventions. Looking in someone's eye, talking to someone, and giving them the confidence, giving them the courage, giving them the epiphanies so they can move forward. That's what moves people.